Uh, yeah. Yes, it's being recorded. Okay, so welcome to yet another wonderful and great One World Seminar. Today our speaker is Eran Shmaya. Uh, Eran completed his PhD under the supervision of Ehud Leol. He has subsequently went on to be at Northwestern University and Yale University, and now is at Stony Brook University and has written many papers on manipulations and on uh, learning and merging and all sorts of groovy subjects like that. Okay, Today okay. he's presenting his papers. Go ahead. Okay, thanks for coming. Thanks for the invitation. This is a joint paper with uh, Yimi uh, from Northwestern. And uh, maybe before I start, I'll just explain what partial truth in the title mean. Well, partial truth means that there is an agent in my model who can only tell the truth, but he doesn't have to tell all the truth. Okay, so nothing but, but the truth, but not necessarily all the truth. And if you want to remember one thing from this uh, talk early in the morning is that we are working on this area. So what do we do with it? Uh, we have two protagonists in our story, um, whom you all know. They are called agent and principal. And what these guys are up to is choosing an action out of some pool of action, some pool of available actions. And the, what drives the interaction between them is that principal is the guy who is, have the power to make the choice which action they will implement. But agent is the one who knows which are the available actions. So an example just to keep in mind is a, a department chair and the dean. The dean and they want to hire somebody out of a, a pool of candidates. The dean is the one that is going to make the decision whom to hire or whether to hire nobody. But the department chair is the one who knows which are the pool of candidates. And they may get different utility from different candidates. Uh, the department chair will offer some candidates to the dean and the dean is going to choose one of them. And when I said partial truth, I mean that the department chair cannot invent candidates that don't exist. He's, he submit uh, uh, packets of, of existing candidates and he give all the information about these candidates uh, that he uh, gives to the dean. Okay. So uh, uh, this was uh, very vague. So let me plunge into the uh, model, Let's see if it works. Okay, uh, let uh, A be a universal set of verifiable candidates. And I will explain later uh, what I mean by verifiable. But this is all the, all the potential CVs that uh, candidates can have. And I will, start with, I will start my description of the story with my agent. The agent has a utility function. The agent has a utility function from each candidate. Is going to be an expected utility maximizer. So this is a von Neumann Morgenstern utility. And I normalize the utility from not taking any action to zero. And here is the description of the interactions. First, the agent has a set of available candidates available actions. And this set of available actions is the agent's type, private type. The agent is going to propose a subset. of this set of available candidates, available actions. Sorry, I'm going to switch from candidates to actions. 
so the agent, the agent is going to propose a subset of actions. And when I say earlier that actions are verifiable, what I meant is that he can only propose actions that are available for him. Okay? He can only propose a subset of A. And then the principal chooses an action from distribution uh, that may depend on the set of candidates that the agent proposed. And I'm going to write here star for a distribution because when I say distribution, I actually mean sub-distribution. I mean that the sum of all the probabilities should be at most one, and all the rest is the probability that he will not choose any action, and if he doesn't choose any action, the agent gets pay of zero. Okay, so every time I say distribution in this talk, what I actually mean is sub-distribution, but I will, forget about, I will forget about it, so I, uh, I leave it to you to remember it. And the one thing I forgot to tell you is that the agent, the principal, at the very beginning, commit to this choice rule row. He commit to what he will do given any set of actions that the agent will offer him. Uh, there's a question. Is A known to both agent, agents? So I principal? have your two A's. Uh, the this capital A, A the, the universal space of The action. universal set, yes. It is known to uh, both uh, agents and both. the principal. And yes. The, uh, but the set of available actions is only known to the agent. And the agent can only propose actions that are available. Okay, so maybe I will... Okay, okay. Okay. Um, so uh, this uh, would have looked so, nicer so, if it was so, empty. Yes, Shmuel. So, so, Ro, so, so the probability distribution, uh, which depends on P, may, may be also defined for P, which is not subset of A or something. Yes, right? the, the probability distribution at, at the beginning, well, it is defined for uh, uh, all because P. Because A is not, because A is not known to the to the principal. Yes, so, so it's defined for every for every subset of uh, of uh, script of A, the, right? Of the universal, yes, of the universal yeah. set. Okay, of okay, that's what I want. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, and uh, so you already see where this uh, issue of uh, partial truth comes into play. The the uh, agent can only offer actions that actually exist, but he may hide some of them. He doesn't have to offer all of them. Uh, we will add uh, possibly other restrictions on the set of candidate, on the set of actions that the uh, uh, agent can propose. And uh, we'll talk about two environments one environment which we called one action one action environment when i say that i'm working in the one action environment or one project environment i mean that p must be a singleton so the agent can just come and offer a single action and then the principal just have to decide whether to take it or not and when i say many actions i mean that p can be any subset of a okay i will i will work in these two different environments and the one action environment is an uh, I, I view it as an exogenous restriction. There is some rules in the university that the chair can only come with one candidate. 
Aaron, I have a question. Um, where does your commitment come in your story? Uh, so the so this is here. I see the assumption in your math, but in your example, the dean and the hiring, where does so, the uh, commitment uh, come uh, there? So the example is not supposed to be an application of uh, this model. It's just uh, to fix idea. Maybe the dean doesn't have commitment power. I don't claim that uh, the example uh, is a good application. I just uh, uh, I just give it to fix ideas. In the paper, we will have more profound uh, words like mergers and acquisitions, and uh, that would be the application. If, the if you don't find the example uh, useful, then don't think about it. No, I just wanted to have the motivation of the commitment. No, no, there is no motivation. This is abstract, uh, completely abstract. Uh, uh, Eran, can you precise what is uh, the utility of the principle? I didn't, I didn't say it yet. I will, I will get to it. Okay, and what does he know about the set uh, capital A? Yes. So, so uh, I, I didn't say that either yet. Okay. But I will get to it. I didn't close the model yet. Uh, so, in this environment, under this mechanism row, some choice function would be implemented. So I will denote the choice function is a function, I denote it by f. This is the function that given the set of available actions, what would actually happen? So this is uh, for every set A of available actions, the agent, given this mechanism, he will propose a set P. Now, which set P he will propose? He will propose the set P that gives him the maximal payoff, right? So he'll propose the set P that is going to maximize the expected payoff to himself. And this is the expected payoff to himself, right? It's the sum over the probability that we'll pick action A times the utility for the, to the agent from action A. And uh, this argmax goes over all the set of actions that he can propose. So these are set subsets of A. And if he's in the one action environment, then these are only singletons. And so, this sum, the sum is A in P? The sum is A in P, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, given the mechanism, something will happen. For every set of available action, there would be a distribution over actions in A, right? So, uh, for every set of available actions, we will end up with some distribution over oh let me write it uh, for every set of actions i will end up with uh, i will end up with a distribution over a this is the choice function that the mechanism rho implements And the first thing that I will ask myself is just to tell you a bit about which choice functions can be implemented. That's why in answer to Jerome's question, I, this, I think it was Jerome, I, uh, I don't yet have to tell you about the goal of the principles because I'm just looking at this object choice functions and I'm asking myself which one of them can be implemented. Uh, implemented by, by the principle? By the principle under some mechanism, yes. yes. But what do you mean by, what do you mean by implementing a choice a distribution? Because basically the principle by fixing the distribution kind of so the, they can choose some, sub, some subset P. Well, right. the principal commit to this thing, which action he will choose out of the set of available actions, uh, out of the set of proposed actions, P. 
Now, given the set A of available actions, the agent is going to choose the set of actions that he proposes in order to maximize the agent utility. And now I'm asking myself which functions from available actions to distributions over available actions can be implemented under this mechanism. You see what's going on here? I'm starting with a set of available actions. The, the agent is going to choose the set of proposed actions in order to maximize the agent's pair. And now the mechanism will pick an action from this set according to the distribution of the mechanism. Okay, so these are two different things. The mechanism, which is which action will be chosen given the set of proposed action, and the uh, choice function, which is which action will end up being implemented given the set of available actions. Why is that then a function from A? It's from the subsets of A. Yeah, so I uh, wrote this uh, uh, notation. It's from subsets of A for every set subset of capital A, of a calligraphic A, for every possible set of available actions, it gives a distribution over available actions, okay? So for every set A of available actions, F of A is distribution over A. And you assume the principal knows the utility of the agent. Yes. Do you also assume that the principal can force the agent which P to, to choose in this argmax? Uh, yes. Why? I mean, what do you mean they can force the agent? He forces Why? the agent to choose, a, a, the, the, the environment forces the agent to only choose a, a set of proposed actions from the set of available actions. Yeah, the but the question is- what's good for the agent. Yeah, yeah but I, uh, the, pro the question is, which of the subsets in the arg max the agent will choose? Ah, if, if, there is a, if there is a different arg, if there is possible arg max, then each one of them is, is no, no, a I, legitimate one. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Why has the principal to know the utility of the agent? I, I don't it's, see it here. Yeah, no, he it's not. Know. It's not. Uh, he has. He has. He has this row, and that's it. Well, why? You are right, Shmuel. For well, now, I don't need. You are right, Shmuel. For now, it doesn't matter whether the principal know the utility of the agent. Later, when I say the principal yeah, chooses the row, yes, sure, you're right. Sure. Then this you're should right. come later. Yeah. Okay. You are correct. For now, it doesn't matter. And if I understood <laughs> Elon's question earlier. Uh, if there are several arg max, then all of them are possible and you can implement uh, several choice functions. So the, the principal way. can enforce a choice of, of which one to choose. Uh, let's not uh, argue about the... Uh, no, I, I'm asking about the, the notion of implementation. Okay, yes, yes. I think, I think the answer to your question. Assume the, the agent is indifferent between all actions. Is everything yes. implementable? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Can you please explain again why F, the domain of F is A and not the power set of A? So, uh, you see this, uh, uh, you see this uh, uh, line that I make as a bold line? What I mean by that is that F maps a set A to a distributions over the set A. I don't mind writing it also as F is a function from the power set of calligraphic A of all the possible actions to distributions. I understand, thank you. Okay, so this is a choice function. Uh, I wanna make a few comments about the, the model. So let's uh, let me go back to uh, my screen with the uh, description of the uh, mechanism. You see that the set of proposed actions here has two roles, or it has two. Uh, it plays two roles in my story. 
One role is that the set of proposed actions gives some evidence to the agent's type. Different agents can propose different things. And this relates to the literature about mechanism design in evid with evidence. Unlike the standard mechanism design with, where every agent can claim to be every other agent, here, not every agent can say the same thing. Okay, so P is already contained some way for the agent to give a hard evidence about his type. And I will get to this issue in a moment, but before that I wanna say that P has another role in our model that doesn't exist in other mechanism design with evidence paper, and that is that P also restrict the set of the actions that the principal can take. Okay, so P has two roles here. One is related to the fact that there is an asymmetric information, and it's a way for the agent to give have hard evidence about his type. And another doesn't even relate to the fact that there is asymmetric information, but it adds some bargaining power to the agent. The agent can force the principal to take an action out of some set. You didn't say that. So, so the principal, the, the dean cannot hire somebody who is out, uh, not on the list of, uh, of the chairman. Uh, yeah, the dean cannot hire somebody who is not on the list or uh, he, can, he can decide not to hire. I mean, he can, can decide not put, to hire. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So he has some uh, default action, so, which is. So that's what you said. The probabilities does not add to one. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let me uh, talk a bit about this messaging structure. First in the, uh, uh, first in the many actions case. In the many actions case, Forget for a minute the fact that the agent also restricts the actions of the uh, principal. Just think about the set P as a message that the agent send to the uh, uh, principal. So when the agent send the message P, the principal gets evidence that the type of the agent A contains P. Every message is some hard evidence. Once you see P, you know that the type of the agent contains P. Uh, one uh, interesting feature of this messaging uh, structure is that the evidence, the agent, if he wants, he can send all the evidence that he has. He can send the maximal evidence that he has by just reporting his own type, by just giving the set of all available actions to the principal. This is the maximal evidence that the agent can give. And this property of the messaging structure that the agent is able to give the maximal evidence that he has is sometimes called normality. Notice that this normality doesn't hold in the one action case. In the one action case, the agent can prove, look, I have this action, and he can prove, look, I have action, a different action but he doesn't have a way to prove that he has both action available, okay? So in the many actions case, we have this property that is called normality. This is not our terminology. This is the terminology from the evidence literature. And another way to look at normality, or maybe not that different, is to say that since in the many actions case, an agent can propose any set of actions, we can think about it when the agent propose a set P as if the agent is saying, P is my type. I am of type P. P is the set of available actions. And what's different here than in standard mechanism design is that in standard mechanism design, every type can claim to be every type. Here, not every type can claim to be every type. Each type can only claim to be types that are smaller, right? It can only claim that the set of available action is smaller than it is. 
which means that the relationship one type can pretend to be another is a transitive relation, relationship. And uh, uh, transitivity is called also nested range condition in some of these papers. So I'll just write here nested range condi condition. And I will get to these things in a moment. And the one action uh, environment doesn't satisfy this condition. So one thing that we will do in the paper is we will see how these conditions from the evidence literature affects the optimal mechanism here. Ron, just to be yes. sure, all of this has to hold off the play path also, right? The restriction that they can only propose available actions even off yes, the play yes, path. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, 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 yes, I don't even call this a play path because I view it as right. yeah, kind just of extraordinary yes. perfection. Thank you. Yes. Uh, one more comment. Uh, you may think that I could talk about a more general mechanism in which, in addition to the hard evidence, P, the agents also send some chip talk message. You can also you say you can say the set uh, set P, but you can also say, uh, look, I uh, think that uh, you should choose this one out of the set P. Or we can send some under message. The reason you may think that this is the case is because this is the case in standard mechanism design papers, and also in evident in mechanism design with evidence papers. But it's not the case in our environment. And the reason in our environment, chip talk would not help, would not enrich the set of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, implementable choice functions is that the set of, the set P already restrict the set of actions that the principal can take. So once the agent gives the principal this set P of actions, there is no more asymmetric information. The, the principal now knows all the utility of the agent from all the actions that the principal can take. So in our model, the evidence kills the asymmetric information. After you give an evidence to the principal, now the principal knows the agent payoff from each action. Okay, and this is true both in the one action in the many actions environment. That's why cheap talk in our model would not help, unlike other uh, mechanism design with evidence papers. Uh, the additional comment I wanted to make is about the revelation principle. Uh, in this many action environments, when you have normality, or equivalently, you have this nested range condition, it is known that the revelation principle holds, which means that we can restrict ourselves to mechanisms in which the argmax here, argmax here, is to choose A. But this is only in, when the revelation principle holds, so this is only in the many action environment. Okay? In these environments, we will restrict ourselves to mechanism in which it's just optimal for the agent to report the truth. Okay? So now, finally, I'm in the point of my story in which I'm going to talk about the principal problem. So I'm going to add a utility function to the principal. And the utility function to the principal from the set of all possible available action. Let's see first what the principal would do if there was no asymmetric information. If the principal knew the set A of available actions, then 
even though in my description of the story, the agent can restrict the principle to pick action from a subset of the set of available actions, this is just a formality. In fact, when there is no asymmetric information, all the bargaining power is at the principal hand because the principal, if he knows the set A of candidates, is going to tell the agent, look, this is the candidate I want. If you offer me this candidate among the set of proposed candidates, I'm going to take it. I'm going to uh, uh, take it. If you don't offer me this action, I'm not going to take any action and you go home with payoff zero. Okay, so if we knew, if the principal knew the set A of available action, the principal could have gotten for every set of available action, it could have gotten the maximal possible payoff. As it happens, he doesn't know. And therefore, under any social function, under any choice function F, is going to suffer some regret. And the regret is the difference between what he would have gotten if he knew the set A of available actions and what he actually get when he doesn't know. And I should have told you, and I didn't, but uh, I'll tell you now, that we also normalize the principal's payoff to be zero if no action is taken. Okay, but uh, we assume that uh, both of them gets positive uh, payoff from each action. This is going to be the regret of the principal. And it is obvious that the under any choice function, there would be some sets available actions under which there would be regret. It is obvious that he cannot always uh, get the maximal uh, uh, payoff because if he always gets the maximal payoff, it means that if the agent offers him a single action, then he must take it because uh, it may be that this is the only available action. But if he takes every single action, then the agent would just pick the action that is good for the agent, which may not be the one that is good for them, that is best for the uh, principal. Okay, so it, it's obvious that there would be some regret. Well, what should we usually do in this case? Well, the standard mechanism design literature say, let us uh, uh, take some prior over the set of available actions and try to find the mechanism that minimizes the expected regret, right? Because the, I don't know what is going to be the set A. I'm going to find the mechanism that minimizes the expected regret or equivalently the mechanism that maximizes the expected payoff to the principal. And this is what uh, under, uh, uh, in a very specific environment, uh, two guys, uh, Armstrong and Vickers did, and I will tell you uh, later what they did, Armstrong and Vickers. But this is not what we are going to do. We are going to assume that the uh, principal is trying to minimize the worst case regret. And the worst case regret from a choice function F is the maximum over set A of the regret if the set of available actions is A. And the goal of the, mechanic, of the uh, principle in my model is to pick a function F, which is implemented by some mechanism rho, that minimizes this thing, that minimizes the worst case regret. So to be more explicit, I will go back to my timeline. And I will say that after the principal commit to the mechanism rho, an adversary should 
chooses the set A. And then the agent picks the set P from this argmax. The principal choose an action and the principal suffer regret. is uh, my new uh, Apple Pencil, but I still don't use it well. The principal suffers the regret, which is maximum uh, the best thing that he could have gotten minus what he actually got. Uh, is the agent's utility common knowledge? Yes, at this point, I get, I mean, not yet, but in a moment when I will say that the, uh, that the principal is trying to find a mechanism that, uh, that minimizes the regret, then the principal would know the agent utility. So the principal knows the agent utility means that when the uh, department chairs come to the dean with a description of a candidate with the CV and recommendation letters and everything, then the dean knows exactly how much utility the department chair will get from it. And the dean also knows how much utility he will get from it. Okay? So notice that I started with an interaction between uh, uh, the principal and the agent. Actually, what I have here is an interaction between the principal and an adversary. They play a zero sum game. In this zero sum game, the principal start by announcing a mechanism row. And then the adversary choose, chooses A, the set of available actions. And then there is an agent, but the agent is very mechanic, very passive here. It doesn't, I mean, what he does is dictated by this uh, row and A. And we get payoff. The principal suffers. Uh, so this is a zero sum game. I just want to emphasize that I'm not looking at the value of this game in mixed strategies. I'm looking at the max mean, right? The, uh, or I'm looking at the mean max. The principal is trying to minimize the maximum that, uh, the uh, maximum payoff that, maximum damage that can happen to him and the principal moves first, right? The principal announces his pure strategy first. This is raw. And then the uh, adversary moves, okay? So there is no, they don't play simultaneously. There is no mixed strategies here. The principal announces raw, and then the agent chooses A. Uh, Eran, question? Yes. Doesn't the, uh, the adversary uh the the view i mean how doesn't this enter the, the zero sum game doesn't it enter the consideration of the chairman of the department the agent no it doesn't the agent just the agent is not against the uh, principal the agent just maximize the agent's payoff so the agent in my model does this regardless of what what, what is raw and what is a the agent is going to do this but doesn't that reveal some information about the pref preferences of the dean that the agent could benefit from? Sorry? The way uh, that the dean plays with the adver adversary should tell me, as if I was the chairman, should tell me something about the dean's information. The, the, agent, the agent knows the dean's uh, utility function from the beginning. The agent knows the dean's utility function. The agent knows the principal's utility function. Okay, and he knows also all the fantasy possible uh, A's that the adversary can provide. He knows all this, but I don't think it matters because in the end, when he comes to the game, there is always a there is already the mechanism raw. He already knows what is the mechanism raw, and the the principal committed to it already, and he already knows what is the set of available actions. 
So when he plays, there is no strategic uh, considerations. He already knows what is the mechanism, he already knows raw, and he already knows what is the set of available actions. He knows that he can choose some P out of this A, and this is the utility that he will get. Thank you. Okay. So here is the moment that we all waited for. Let's see if it will work. Sorry. I'm going to try to show you my slide of related literature. Sorry, this is really too early in the morning for me, obviously. Do you see it? Do you see it? Sorry. You see yeah, the slide? We see it. We see it. Okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, what do I have here? First, the paper of Armstrong and Vickers. This is the paper that I mentioned earlier. This was our direct uh, um, inspiration, and it's still probably the most related uh, paper, even though now we are understanding more the, the relationship to uh, mechanism design with evidence. Uh, another paper of uh, choosing a, a project out of a set of projects, but not in a mechanism design uh, uh, environment, but with evidence is this paper by uh, Ben Porat, Deckel, and Lippan. And you see that our uh, um, that our uh, paper is in the intersection of two literatures. One is the literature on mechanism design with evidence, and another is the literature in mechanism design with worst case regret. And I wrote here a bunch of papers, and please don't be offended if your paper is not here because uh, I, uh, I, uh, uh, we just uh, wrote it uh, in the last minute. And actually, oh, I, I feel really bad because my co-author, uh, uh, we, we arranged it according to a uh, uh, year, but I somehow managed to screw this and I, uh, I uploaded a, an, an earlier version. So sorry about that. This, and maybe some of them are, are missing. Okay, uh, one more thing I want to say. I would like to have another bullet here that talks about a, a, the literature on bargaining, because you see that I did have some, there, there is some bargaining between the agent and the principal going on here, and both of them has some power. The principal can commit to the mechanism, but the agent also can give in a way a take it or leave it offer by, by giving the set P of candidates of uh, actions. So um, uh, so I would like to add here a bullet about uh, bargaining, but I, I, we don't have papers yet. We're still uh, looking for it. Okay, so I'm going to take five minutes to tell you what uh, Armstrong and Vickers did in a Bayesian environment, and then I'm... I'm, I'm for, I, uh, so I, I have an hour, right? Or I'm going to assume that I have an hour, but... Yeah, you have an hour for the talk, but then uh, the discussion is uh, flexible. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to take five minutes to tell you what uh, Armstrong and Vickers did, and then I'm going to uh, tell you our optimal mechanism. So what Armstrong and Vickers did is they look at the Bayesian environment. So. They look at the Bayesian environment. When I may say Bayesian environment, I mean they had some prior over the set A of actions. And what is this prior? First, their universal set of actions uh, uh, was the set, was a product set. And each element here, you could think about it as as an action, we identify the action with the payoff that it gives to the agent and the principal. So U is the payoff to the agent and V is the payoff to the principal. 
Okay, so this is the set of actions. And you see what is the function u and v, right? It's just a projection over the coordinates. So we are identify every actions with the payoff it gives to these two guys. Okay. And, uh, and the payoff is in this rectangle. It doesn't matter what, uh, I mean, this, this, uh, this under u is uh, some parameter. And they assume that actions first are IID from this set with some distribution over this set, over this rectangle. So actions are IID. And the number of actions is independent of the realizations of the actions. Okay, so there is some number which is uh, distributed according to some of the standard distributions that we know. I don't know, geometric or Poisson or uniform. This is some integer. And then given this number, we randomize IID actions from this set A. Okay. And they looked in the one project envir environment, one action environment. So the agent can only offer one action. And they restricted themselves to deterministic mechanisms. And when you restrict yourself to deterministic mechanism, deterministic mechanism is just you give me an action and I just tell you whether I will agree to it or not. Okay? So deterministic mechanisms are essentially just a set of possible things, a set of uh, uh, actions that I will be willing to take. Okay? So this is what's called sometimes a delegation solution because the, uh, the principle essentially when he restricts himself to deterministic mechanism, the principle essentially tells the uh, agent, uh, look, I will only agree to actions from this set D of action. Now pick whichever action you want from this set D of action. And the solution they, they uh, uh, solved for the optimal delegation uh, solution. And uh, one interesting feature that they, uh, that they got is that it is of the form uh, it is of this form. So for some function R. So you are willing to accept a project if it gives the principle sufficiently high payoff. Uh, how much sufficiently high depends on the payoff that it gives to the agent. And they write some control problem that identifies this function R. Okay. And what we are going to do is worst case regret with the same set calligraphic A of available action. Okay. And let me write you our theorem for the one agent environment. One action environment. So now we are looking at the one action environment, but we are not looking at deterministic mechanisms. We are looking at uh, uh, Bayesian me at the uh, uh, randomized mechanisms, like I said before, and I'm looking for the mechanism that minimizes the worst case regret. And here is the theorem. I'm looking now at another game. In my original zero sum game, which had a huge set of strategies for the agent and the uh, principal, for the uh, principal and the adversary, in my original zero sum game, the principal moved first. He chose a mechanism, and then the adversary moved and chose an action. Now I'm looking at a much smaller game, which I can solve on Mathematica. This is a game in which the adversary just chooses one number V and the principal chooses between these two. The principal now has only two actions, either this or this. Okay. And I'm looking at the value of the game. And if you 
do the calculation quickly, it turns out to be this number. But it doesn't matter. I mean, the actual number. And this is, uh, uh, this is the optimal worst case regret. And the mechanism that implements it is given by this formula. If you offer me, so this is a one project, and I'm just telling you the mechanism, the probability that I will accept a project UV. If V is sufficiently high, if you offer me sufficiently high payoff, then I accept it with probability one. And if you, you offer me low payoff, then I accept it with probability that is decreasing in your payoff. Okay, uh, I don't know if it's clear what's written here. What's written here is U underbar, which is the parameter, which is the uh, bound on the uh, agent's payoff. Okay, this is the probability that I will accept it. And uh, I intended to prove this, but I don't think I will have time. Uh, the proof is rather simple. I want to emphasize one interesting property of this mechanism that rho uv, the probability that I will accept a project, increases in v, increases in the payoff to the principal. This already existed in, uh, in uh, Armstrong and uh, Vicker solution, in the delegation solution. It also decreases in the utility of the agent. So if the agent offers a project that gives the agent high utility, I am less likely to accept it. And the reason is that if the agent offers a project that gives the agent high utility, I am worried that he may be hiding actions that are better for me. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, kind of the interesting property of this uh, optimal mechanism. And it's, uh, I think it's also an interesting question in the Bayesian environment to uh, find out what are the properties over the prior that will induce this property for the uh, optimal mechanism. But uh, it seems like a difficult question because we don't know what to say about the optimal mechanism in Bayesian environment without assuming deterministic mechanism. Okay. Are you sure about the, the expression for, uh, for the, the optimal, whole star, R star? The minimum, they should not be equal, the two terms in the minimum? Uh, the, 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 uh, that one minus V minus U bar, the second term of the minimum? Uh, I think I'm sure, but yes, you're right. The, this is the V that makes these two terms equal. And uh, when you substitute this V into this formula, you get uh, this, may, unless I'm mistaken here, or maybe I'm mistaken, but that's not, uh, I don't think I am because uh, I think I just copied it from the paper, but maybe I made some typo. Okay, but you're right. This is the V that equates these two things and I just substitute it here. And I just substitute this V here. Okay, so let's, uh, may, maybe I made a mistake in the last uh, element. Uh, let me, well, I, I, I think I can explain to you where this comes from in one minute, where this uh, R star comes from, but it will not really be a proof. It will just be a, a, a quick explanation. Let's look at the probability that we are going to accept if the agent offers the project that gives the agent utility one and the principal utility V. There are two options. Options one is that we accept this project with a very low probability, with probability that is smaller than under U. In this case, if this is the only project that is available,
we suffer regret of v times one minus under u, right? Because we could have gotten v, but we only accept this action with probability under u, and therefore we suffer this regret. On the other hand, if this arrives with probability greater than u, then it may be that the set of available action is this, but there was also an action which is very bad for the agent and very good for the principal. And because we were willing to accept the action 1v with such a high probability, the agent prefer to only propose action 1v. And now we suffer at least one minus v, because we could have gotten one, but we end up getting at most v, because we, we take this action one minus v, and maybe also with some, only with some probability. Okay, so whatever we do, whatever our mechanism does, either we are going to suffer this, or we are going to suffer this. So we are going to suffer at least the minimum between these two things, and this is true for every v. Okay, this is where it comes from. Okay, those who followed me followed. I'll say quickly, very quickly, the structure of the optimal mechanism in the multi-action environment. It's what we call the trading mechanism. There is some function P of V. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what is just the P, but we, we can pin it down in, we pin it down exactly, we calculate in the paper. If the agent offers one project, we implement, we take it, with probability p of v. We accept with probability p of v. If the agent offers a set, proposes a set, then we randomize in a way that maximizes principal's payoff subject to agent receiving exactly the maximum that the agent could have received if he offered only one project out of this set. And the maximum that he could have received if he offered only one action is the maximum from this set of u times p of v. Okay? This mechanism will make the agent report truthfully because the more the, action, the agent reports, the, the highest this maximum can be, right? And the so the agent doesn't have any interest to hide anything. And subject to his reporting truthfully, he will get this amount and we will just maximize how much as we can. Okay. And uh, maybe I will just copy to the slide the actual regret that comes out for it. And I will then Uh, finish. So this is the regret that comes out of this mechanism. Uh, 
sorry, I should have said that M here is the under, is the under U. It's the uh, lower bound on the agent's payoff. Okay. So this is it. We characterize the uh, uh, optimal mechanism in these two environments. And we had some interpretation of what's going on in the uh, one agent environment, the, uh, uh, the probability of accepting decreases in the agent utility. In the multi actions environment, we have this trading that is going on. Okay, I'm two minutes after time, so thanks a lot. And I am happy to stay. Uh, okay, that's, I think, let me try to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I can answer additional questions if there are. Yeah, that's that's the time for questions. Okay. Then. I was just looking at that formula, Aaron, um, and I was trying to check yeah. if what happens when m equals zero, but it went away too fast. And you say it goes from one fourth ah, okay. to That's zero, I tell but you I didn't actually I see one fourth. I actually saw infinity because m square was in the bottom. So I made a mistake probably. Can you just help me there a little bit? Uh, sorry, I, uh, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I want to, be willing to accept the option that I made a mistake here because I just no, copied it so from. Just, uh, I'm interested in one fourth. Uh, so the paper, the, 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 so if m equals zero, the worst case regret there is zero, and if m equals zero, then uh, you have to take the uh, um, the limit of the thing. I mean, the, the the formula that I that I posted, I assume that. Uh, Either it's incorrect, or uh, you have. If it's zero over zero, then you have to. Uh, then you have to uh, yeah. look at the limit, right? Sure. But but maybe it's incorrect. So let's not. No, get, no uh, but, but you're it. saying it's one fourth. You're saying. So, yeah, but it is. I think. I think in the one fourth, we are okay. sure. Unless Yeni can say something. It's very nice. Yeah. One fourth result. Yes. It's one fourth. Uh, yeah. It's one fourth, and for the uh, single uh, project, it was one half. Mm. So you you gain something with the ability to trade. And why is it called trade? I don't well, see trading uh, there because I just see, um, yeah, so can you explain? Like you, you offer this set of, uh, of uh, uh, projects and we, we don't take the one that is best for me. We don't take the one that is best for you. In, among this set of uh, projects, there is one that is best for the agent and, and there is one that is best for the uh, principal. We don't take this one. We take some kind of combination between them that uh, guarantee certain payoff to the uh, that guarantee the agent what he could have gotten uh, like without trade what he could have gotten if he uh, just uh, uh, reported the one that he likes the most may i ask a question now sure uh, thank you one question uh, you said it's more on the intuitive level because I do not exactly remember the formulas. You said that you basically reward the agent for giving something which benefits the principal and punish the agent, roughly speaking, for giving for suggesting something that benefits the agent. Makes sense, but if that offer if that offer happens to benefit both the agent and the principal. Does it still make sense to to uh, punish the agent for getting benefit himself too? So remember that uh, I mean I, I made a mistake that I stopped uh, showing the screen so uh, quickly, uh, and it will take me forever now to uh, upload it again. But uh, remember that my function, the probability that I will accept an action, was increasing in the principal's payoff and decreasing in the agent's payoff. 
Yes. So if you offer something that gives the principal high payoff, you will get it in, implemented with high probability. But, but it has to be sufficiently high, right? And sufficiently high depends on... The question is as follows. I mean, I, I, of course, I understand why your suggestion is good, why it works, and I trust that you've proven that more than just an intuition is fine. My question is the follow, as follows. Can you maybe improve upon what you've done if you say that if the kind of if the uh, uh, if the principal gets enough, then also the agent is not punished for having something. So that you only punish the agent if, if she gets more than the principal. Because what I mean so, is that it can be that the agent will kind of will not offer something good for the principal because maybe it's good for the agent to offer something worse for the principal, which is also worse for her. So the uh, uh, first the in the in the mechanism that I presented, if the principal gets sufficiently high payoff, the the action is implemented with probability one. Mm -hmm. And that was the case in the mechanism I present. You cannot improve the mechanism that I presented because they have a theorem that I mean that it is the optimal uh, mechanism. And I don't think there is much to do in comparing the. the payoff of the principal and the agent. These are both uh, von Neumann, Morgenstern utility defined on different things. So, uh, oh, but now, now I think I understand why it's optimal. If, if the, it's enough for the principal to get a high path for the right, you're right, you're right. It's kind of, okay, now I recall. Thank you. Thank you. Right, good. So if there are no more questions, I'm going to take a second coffee and... Uh, Any more questions, you, uh, people? Well, if there are no questions, then we thank you again. Okay. Thanks a lot thank for you. the invitation and the patience. Okay. Very, well done. Cheers. <laughs>